Greetings all, Shane Bruce, Rest of My Daisy, and today we're going to have a little chat with you about wood. Yeah, maple, figured maple, and how we get figured maple to go from looking low like that, just a flat plank, to something like this, which is a stock that's ready to have some dye applied, that'll end up drying out and looking like this, which is ready for oil, and when we get the oil on it, It'll wind up being that. Absolutely gorgeous. Wood that you're proud to own. Wood that makes the gun unique. It's the thing that I love most about what I do. It's dressing up a daisy, putting <laughs> spats on a pig, and having a gun that I like to shoot and show off. Now, on the YouTube channel, I got an inquiry from an old video we had put up a while back about stocks. And uh, as I responded to the guy's questions, I realized that there was a lot of this stuff that I have never talked about to the general public, uh, mainly because I've always felt it was kind of on the boring side. And you really had to be a wood geek to be able to, you know, get your head wrapped into it. But, you know, after I got my lengthy response posted, I realized, hey, I need to do a video on this. So we're going to talk about figured wood. And the first thing we're going to talk about in figured wood is how do you find figured wood? Figured wood, by definition, is, uh, in maple anyway, typically curly or flame or tiger stripe. And what it has is undulations in the fibers of the wood. And finding figured wood in this form can be kind of daunting because you've got to rely on your eyeball. But you can't get confused and mistake saw marks for grain, for wood figure. So one way to do it is to Take the piece and tip it, and you'll see a shift, a change, as the uh, fibers of the wood reflect light. Another trick is to take a look at the uh, sawn or unsawn edges and see if you can detect any styrations, any banding. And that would be good to see styrations because that means that the figure goes all the way through the wood. But still, incredibly difficult to do with just the Mark One eyeball. So let's say that you do find yourself some figured wood. And you decide, hey, I can make a gun stock out of this. Well, naturally, you'd have to do some forming and some cutting. And then you wind up over here. Uh, this is a stock set that is going to go on a 105 buck uh, as part of a two-gun order that I've been working on. And in this particular case, because we've done some sanding and the wood surface is a bit, bit uh, slicker, you can actually see the grain patterns, the stripes, on both sides of the stock. So that is cool. Now, up here on the forearm, same thing. Uh, and this is a glue up. So it's actually two pieces of wood, roughly this thick, that are uh, now glued together and inlaid so they'll form the forearm part of our stock set. Now, here is a cutoff from the chunk of wood I made these stock sets out of. And you can see that the um, banding effect is visible that way. Not that way, but is visible here. So when you're hunting for figured wood, Try to make sure that you've got figure on both sides because it doesn't always work that way. All right, so then you go from a form stock set that's standard, sanded down to about 220, that's as far as I take these things, to a stock set that has been dyed. Now you'll notice the, the surface texture on this looks much different. You might want to try to get a tight shot here because it's kind of fuzzy. It's, it's kind of fuzzy. In the corner. And uh, I'll hold it steady and that way you can get your focus right. But it's fuzzy where the other stuff was uh, rather, relatively slick and cool. And that's because I use a wood-based dye. Uh, excuse me, a water-based dye. And water will make the grain fiber stick up. It'll whisker. That's what the phraseology is. And uh, unlike some folks, after I apply, apply the first coat of dye, water-based dye, I do not sand it back. I put on three to four to five coats until I get a color that I'm looking for, a dark reddish brown and with uh, noticeable stripes. It's a little bit more prevalent on this side. I ignore the dust because that's coming off my fingertips. It's a very dusty environment in here. So anyway, this is dyed and it has been drying for about three or four days. It's about ready to have oil put on it. And once we get oil put on it, it'll end up looking like this. You can see here that the uh, Tiger stripes are prominent. The, the, the wood grain is prominent. You can see how the, the wood itself is contoured. But most importantly, as you change your, your focus on it, the uh, reflections 
from the styrations will change and that gives it chateauans which is french for dancing wood which makes it so cool for gun stocks all right so that's the baseline process let me show you how we actually put the die on the wood now i use wood dies and they're water based and i actually use three kinds of die to make this the secret and the secret goop the secret sauce the sauce that gives the guns the colors that i want all right so that's just plain water now here's something for you history freaks this is a Brownells water soluble dye that i inherited from my dad that tells you this thing's been around since about 1950 and there's still dye in here i've been using it for three years and there's still a fair amount of dye in there because this stuff is super concentrated so this one is red <laughs> that's grover's writing and if you take a look at the uh, the label here, it's actually what they call scarlet uh, on the old Brownells ordering chart, which I cannot believe has any validity anymore. Anyway, so I use a Brownells scarlet red, a Brownells yellow, which is also called turquoise. It's also on the side label here. And this does not look yellowish when you take a peek at it, but it turns out very yellow if you put it in water. I did a uh, stock set two years back where I attempted one color and then overlaid another color as opposed to mixing them, and it turned out to be olive drab. And that was a shocker for me. Now, I ran out of my dark brown, so I transitioned over to another brand called Transfast. Now, you can pick this up at Rockler. You can buy it online. It's another water-soluble dark mission brown is what this is called doesn't look very brown in there it looks kind of red but when you throw it in water it turns brown so you take these three and you kind of fiddle with this and you got to get this right for your taste I'll show you here on this sample uh, normally I'll do a test on a, a piece of wood a piece of scrap that came out of the stock set that I'm gonna die and you'll notice the shade of coloring here uh, I find the yellow is very important because after you uh, apply the oil and sand it back the yellow is going to highlight the lighter wood that is not styrated. The brown sucks into the mission, uh, into the uh, styrations really well to help define the stripes. And the red gives it a tone that I think looks close to what you would see in an old Pennsylvania long rifle. So normally what you want to do is before you start slapping stain on your stock, you want to dab it on a piece of wood that came out of the same bunch of wood. And the reason I stress that is that uh, trees are trees. Every tree, believe it or not, is different from the every other tree. And the combination of dye that worked on your last attempt uh, and looked great might need to be tweaked before you try it on your new attempt. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take a little bit of this dye solution and we're going to just kind of blop it on there and we're going to look and see what kind of coloration we get. And our interest here is... Uh, how does it look visually? Is it uh, is it the brown brown we want? Is the brown going to pick up the uh, the fiddle? And is the yellow going to give us the undertone that we want so that we have a kind of a honey tobacco sunburst thing going on? So you let that kind of suck in. And if you get a little impatient, I'm working on a type frame, so you can get a blotter and you can uh, apply it and just blot it off. And that'll give you an idea or what you're going to end up looking like. And what I really like about the sawn end grains is you'll see how the um, the yellow is spreading out a little faster than the red and, and the uh, dark mission brown. But the overall result after multiple coats will hopefully end up looking about like so. And then when we actually get oil on it and sand it back with 320 on the final app, we'll wind up with a look like this. Nice and smooth, looks sharp, good color, good shot toyons. So that's going to work. I'm happy with that. We'll throw this off to the side and we'll get to the process of actually putting some oil on it. But we're going to move this guy because we might get a splatter. Not that it's going to affect the gun because it already has an oil fish on it. But there's no reason to mess up stuff. All right. Now, in terms of putting on stain, typically you'll do that with a cloth. And if you watch any of these luthier videos on YouTube, cloth is the way to go. I'm going to use a brush. <laughs> because it's water and I'm going to put a lot on there but as you can see what's in the uh, the bucket here it's not that much 
in terms of volume but it will suck right in so you just start brushing it on and you're going to get a nice even coat on it and then as it dries or once it dries out from this coat we'll put another coat on it. because the first coat here is its job is mainly to raise the grain what we want is to get a little bit of swelling going on so that the grain fibers actually stand up and our next coat will penetrate deeper and I typically like I said put three coats four coats five coats I put it on until I'm happy with the density of color because when we go to put the oil on it we're going to use uh, 320 sandpaper on our last coat of oil on the uh, on the dyed stocks and that'll uh, take the whiskers down and also formulate some stuff that's going to get jabbed into uh, whatever cracks and crevasses might have occurred now with my brush I'll pick up the stuff that dribbles on my uh, paper I'm not proud that way and we'll put the first coat on on the end grain give it a healthy dose every place there's a contour or a curve on the stock the grain pattern is interrupted so the fibers themselves are more susceptible to absorbing the uh, dye that we're putting on so we're going to give it a nice good solid coat make sure she's got good coverage here on the end it really will suck in and suck in deep so we're going to put it on pretty heavy right there a couple of drips and dribbles on our uh, protective sheet are not a problem so we got our first application on we we'll take a look at it and as you can see it's already starting to shift this is going to be a really nice looking piece of wood when we get done it's going to have good strong curl and it's going to really shine maple is a very light wood unlike walnut uh, oak typically tends to be white but you don't see it used in gun stocks very much all right so you got your first piece done set her up so oh no not the kiss of death <laughs> set it up so that it has a place where it won't fall over of its own accord and then go after your second piece now here you can see we've gotten some splatters and splatches on it nothing to get concerned about because we're going to flood the zone one more time the forearm here is even stronger on the curl so we're going to give her a good shot paint it up good you can begin to see how some of that uh, grain pattern starts playing out under the light and you can see it when it's wet better than you can see it when it's dry but on the very first coat yeah, you're going to get kind of a light presentation it takes a little bit of material to get in there and suck it up you can pick up your excess put it in there now some folks don't stain interior what I do I don't put oil on it but I will put stain on it and uh, I take that back I do put oil on it when I'm in the finishing phase but I don't sand it to 320 because this is going to be under the gun uh, it does need its protection from the oil but it doesn't need to be finished sanded not in my opinion and if you want to finish sand it you go right for it because it's your project and you can do what you want so here we go we're wiping her down getting ready to put this up and slap another coat on the buttstock all right now let's take a look at the buttstock it's only been a few seconds and as you can see it's no longer looking wet and fluid because the uh, water has done its trick and it has lured the dye into the fiber of the wood so we put another coat on her and as you can see the definition is improving this is going to go on a 105 buck that is the opposite from a Grandpa Jim special because we're putting a uh, Cobalt 327 in it overbore air tube and we are going to install the M25 peep sight by removing the uh, factory spring block and installing a uh, modified spring block in its place and this will give the gun slightly longer sight radius going to do the uh, fiber optic front sight on it as well it's already quite a super thumper I've done mechanical work on the receiver and she's running right at 348 average over 10 rounds 
which tells me it's going to be a super thumper once it gets broke in. Let's see if we can get that stand. All right, one more coat on this. And then we're going to back off and let it dry for a while. <coughs> There we go. That's going to be really, really short when we get done. All right, kids. Well, that is some of the mysteries of stocking guns, making stocks for guns, and doing it on your own for your Daisy Red Rider. This is uh, all we've got for you today, kids. So this is Shane Bruce with Rest of My Daisy signing off.